Welcome to GOCC Online. I'm Eric Anderson, lead pastor here at Global Outreach Community Church, and I want to welcome you to our online worship gathering. Here at GOCC, we are a church that's growing people to be leaders in their families as well as in their communities, spreading the love of Jesus throughout the world. I want to personally invite you to our 930 in-person worship service here at The Overlook in Atascacita, Texas. Or if you're joining us online, check us out on all of our social media platforms. Visit us at www.globaloutreachcc.org. Remember, your life matters because you matter to Christ. Now join us as we praise and worship our holy God. Celebrate your Savior. 
in me. Come on, why don't you put your hand on yourself? Come on, something is rising today. In this atmosphere of faith, come on and rise to the occasion. Receive what God has done. Hallelujah.
turn seas into armies. Hallelujah. You turn joy into victory. Yes. You're the only one who can. Hallelujah. God, we celebrate you at this place. We thank you. Hallelujah. And with the wave of your hands and the clapping of your hands, Let's seal our thanks with our high praise today. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. He's worthy to be praised and adored. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So we lift up our holy hands in one accord. Can we lift up holy hands in one accord? There's something about one accord. Hallelujah. Come on, even in the quiet, let's lift our hands in holy. Giving is a privilege and responsibility for those who have received from God the gift of eternal life. Here at Global Outreach Community, giving is an act of worship. We worship God with the first 10% of our first fruits. When we give from biblical motives in line with the biblical principles and priorities, God will bless with his results. There are three ways you can give. They're listed on the screen. Text giving at 281-809-6778. You can also give online at globaloutreachcc.org. Or you can mail your gift to Global Outreach Community Church, P.O. Box 1146, Humble, Texas 77347. Thank you for partnering with us as we seek to expand God's kingdom glory. It's so good to see you this morning. Happy Resurrection Sunday. I know some people say Easter. For me, I say resurrection because Christ has risen. He got up from the grave. Uh, So it's so good to see you to our guests, those who are online. Welcome to Global Outreach Community Church. You're now a part of the global family. So let's just celebrate those who are worshiping with us online this morning. You know, God is so good. Even at the, uh, I would say, the tail end of a pandemic, he is still taking care of his children. And I am so grateful for a faithful God. Today, we want to celebrate communion. So if you did not have a chance to receive a communion cup, I'm going to ask that Minister Holmes, if you would assist us this morning, you would just uh, let us know by raising your hands. Um, the communion cups are outside on the table. Minister Sweeney and Minister Holmes will assist us this morning. And as they are assisting us, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. Paul writes to the church at Corinth, giving instructions regarding the communion. And today we're celebrating Holy Communion on Resurrection Sunday. And as we celebrate communion, we are recognizing Christ's suffering and his death until he returns. It's not something that believers should take lightly. That our Savior was crucified. He hung on a rugged cross. He allowed them to pierce him in the side to nail his hands, to pierce his feet. He had all authority. He could have come down from the cross. But he stayed because he had you in mind. He stayed because he had me in mind. And I want you to realize this on Resurrection Sunday. He died for you. Because he died for me and he suffered for me. I want to celebrate this Savior. So 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I have passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, 
this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this. Whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. And whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Verse 28, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread, drink of the cup. So this morning, I want to give you time just to examine where you are in your relationship with Christ. And as you examine yourself, I want you to go to God and ask God to forgive you of your sins. I'm not the judge. I can't judge you. But there is a righteous judge. And I thank God that this judge has satisfied the righteous payment for my sins. So right before we take communion, heads are bowed, hearts are lifted, eyes are closed. I want to give you a moment to just pray. To seek the face of our Lord. To bow in his presence. To recognize his majesty. His holiness. Father, we thank you for sending your son to die in our place. We thank you that communion is a privilege and yet it is a responsibility of every believer that at the point that we trust Christ as Savior, we're made right with you. And it's not because of our works, least any should boast. We've become the righteousness of you because of Jesus. So thank you for Jesus. His suffering on the cross. Thank you that the blood came streaming down. And thank you for that great hymn. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So as we ask forgiveness of our sins, we ask that you will continue to fill us with the spirit of the living God. And as we come into your presence today, have your way. In Jesus' name, let us all say amen. The Bible records that as Jesus was eating with his disciples, he took bread he blessed it. He broke it. He gave it to his disciples. And he said, eat all of it. Let's eat together. Likewise, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to his disciples, and said, drink all of it. Let's drink together. And last and did my Savior bleed and did my sovereign die. Should he boast that sacred head for such a worm? As I sing at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received. 
received my sight and now I am happy all the day at the cross at the cross at the cross where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away oh it was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day Luke chapter 24 Luke chapter 24 I want to look at verse 13 through 33. We may not read all of these scriptures, but I want to call your attention to Luke chapter 24. Luke 24, verses 13 through 33. And our subject for this morning is the Emmaus experience. And my prayer is that at some point in your life, if it has not already happened, you would have an Emmaus experience. Verse 13, now the same day two of them were going to the village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with one another about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. That's important. Verse 17, and he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk? And they stood still, their faces downcasted. And one of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know these things that have happened there in these days? Jesus' response is, what thing, he asked, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to deliver us or redeem us from Israel. Look at verse 30. Here's Jesus. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other. Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and he opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, Is it true? The Lord had risen and had appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus recognized by them when he broke the bread the Emmaus experience in Luke chapter 4 we have this account of people who see the risen Savior but before they see this risen Savior in Luke chapter 24 Luke is detailed in this account he lets us know that these people are discouraged they're disappointed. They're downcast. But at the point that they see Jesus for themselves, they experience true joy on the inside. And as I make my way through this text this morning, I want to say to you, at the point that you trust Christ as Savior, that you meet Christ for yourself, it's nothing that mom has told you about, nothing that daddy told you about, nothing that 
Papa and Big Mother has told you about, but at the point that you meet Jesus and you have a personal encounter, a personal experience with the reason Savior, joy ought to flood your heart. And so joy is different from happiness. My happiness is dependent on everything that happens around me, but joy is dependent on what's on the inside. And because I'm saved and I trust Christ and I have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, I have the infilling presence of the Holy Spirit, it doesn't matter what comes in my life and what goes out of my life. It doesn't matter how hard I fall or how high I rise. It doesn't set the joy in my life because Jesus has already set the joy and he's already established the joy in my life. And this morning, I hope you can make that same declaration. No matter how you feel in your body, no matter what's going on in your finances, no matter what's going on in your home, that does not set the joy of your life. Your joy comes from knowing that Jesus is the only one who can give true joy. And that's when I got up this morning. I was so excited, Ms. Rios, to be here. It didn't matter if it was only three people. Thank God that it's a a crowded room, but if it was only me and Jesus, Crystal Jesus had already set the temperature of my joy because he got up in my life. And I really want to encourage someone today that's going through a hard time, a rough spot. Things are not working out like you thought they would. So what? Jesus has a way of blessing you on the front end, but I love what I love about Jesus. He blesses me on the back end. And that's why when I get up, I want to make sure that my thinking is right, my speaking is right, and my heart is right because he is in control of everything. So when we look at the text, the front half of the text, verses 1 through 9, we see the women. The women show up at the tomb to anoint Jesus' body with spices. And they get to the tomb, but the stone has been rolled away. And they look inside, and they see the linen has been folded neatly. So the stone is no longer there, the linen is folded neatly, and Jesus' body is not in the tomb. And what happens is two angels show up and they're beaming with light and they reminded the women that Christ got up from the tomb just like he said. And if you look at verse 12, the women, 11, ran back to tell the 11 disciples and those who were with them. The disciples did not believe the women. Two reasons why they did not believe the women. One, they thought the women were speaking nonsense. It's in the Bible. They thought that these women had lost their mind. They had spent three years with Jesus. They had listened to Jesus teach. They seen Jesus do miracles. Jesus had already prophesied that he would die, but on the third day he would get up and they still missed it. How often do we miss it? When we read the biblical text and we see the writings of God, we see the promises of God, but when hard times come, we fall apart, we crack, we stress out because we miss it. They missed it. Nonsense. Here's the second reason why the men didn't believe. In biblical days, they did not value the word of a woman. Listen to me, biblical days, that a female's word would not stand up in court. That she wasn't even allowed to come to the court. So they did not value the word, and they thought it was nonsense. But I love Peter. Peter was the only one to run to the tomb, and yet he was confused. And this is where we pick up the Emmaus experience. My desire today is to give you four takeaways, four things that I want you to hold fast, to hold close to your heart once you meet Jesus. Here we go. Here's the first one. There are two men, Cleopas. They're walking on the road to Emmaus, this small village, and it's seven miles from Jerusalem. And as they are walking, Jesus shows up on the scene. But unbeknownst to them, Jesus 
did not allow himself to be recognized. And now they're in a conversation with the risen Savior, and they are discussing things amongst each other. But when Jesus shows up, they begin to ask Jesus certain questions. And as they are talking to Jesus, they realize that Jesus, unbeknownst to them, did not really know about the resurrection. Jesus was incognito. But you need to watch the play in the text. Jesus is really questioning them about what they don't know. He knows what's going on, but he's questioning them to see if they really know that he's the risen Savior. Here's what we can learn. Number one, they was confused. And whenever you are confused in your life, write this down, you can trust God's timing. You can trust God's timing. Look at verse 16. Verse 16, it says, but they were kept from recognizing him. They did not see Jesus for who he really was. But look at verse 31. Then their eyes were open and they recognized him. What happened? Initially, they didn't see Jesus. But the back end of the narrative, they see Jesus. Something happened in between from them moving from not understanding who Jesus was, not being able to see him, to now seeing him. And I want to argue that something happened. What could it be that happened? Maybe, maybe they didn't see Jesus because of their unbelief. How often do you refuse to believe the word of God, the voice of the Holy Spirit, or a word that God sent to you from somebody else, and your unbelief locks up, blocks the hand of Jesus? Maybe it was their unbelief. How about this? Maybe God supernaturally prevented them from seeing Jesus. And I think there are times in our life that God supernaturally prevents us from seeing things. Here's the why. Here's the reason why. Because he has to grow us up mature uh, and spiritually mature. That he has to build us up because we're babes in Christ. And we need to move from being babes in Christ to being full grown, spiritually mature adults that's walking in the anointing of God, walking in the power of God. And we're trusting God to do the unbelievable in our life. Could it be unbelief? Secondly, was it supernaturally that God prevented them from seeing him? Because in the Greek, if you read the text, the text says that their eyes were kept from seeing Jesus. In other words, God prevented them from seeing Jesus because he wanted them to see him at the right time. They knew facts about Jesus, but they didn't know the face of Jesus. And we come to church Sunday after Sunday, and we know facts about Jesus, but we don't know the face of Jesus. We believe the Bible, facts, but hard times come, we don't know the face. We believe the Bible on marriage, facts, but when arguments happen, we run to the divorce courts, face. We believe Jesus when the money is good, but when we get laid off, we don't know the face of Jesus because it's a hard time. You not only need to know about facts, but you need to know about face. Thank God for the facts of the Bible, but thank God for the face of Jesus that shows up in the biblical text. And what Jesus does is Jesus explains the word to them. And if you get into the Emmaus experience, Jesus says in verse 19, hey, he was a prophet. He's speaking of himself. He was powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priest and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death. And they crucified him. Jesus started breaking down the word to them that not only they had the facts, but now they could see his face. It's God's timing. God revealed the face of Jesus at the right time. And can I encourage someone today? Maybe what you've been asking God for hasn't arrived right time. Maybe what you're praying for hadn't hit your doorstep right time. That's the first thing that we can learn. It's all about God's timing. God gives discernment. And because he gives discernment, we got to walk in that discernment. Here's the second thing that we can recognize. They had misplaced 
expectations. Misplaced. They're walking on the road seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And they're discussing things. Jesus shows up. Jesus asks them questions. They give an answer. And their answer is, we thought this Jesus, this prophet, would redeem us from the Roman government. Misplaced. Jesus had already told his disciples he was coming to save them from their sins. They were expecting him to deliver them from the Roman government. Can you see how their expectations were misplaced? How often do we as believers have mis-expectations about what we want God to do in our lives? And the reason why we experience misplaced expectations is because it's about our agenda, not God's agenda. We create our own plans. We create our own agendas. We put our own plans, our own agendas together. We move forward, and then we come back and say, God, can you bless this? And what God is saying, let me bless you on the front end. Let me speak into this on the front end. Before you take that job, before you get into that relationship, before you move, allow me to speak to you, because if I speak to you on the front end, you won't go through the hell and the hardship on the back end. I'm a product of that. I'm preaching to me. There were times that the saints of God would give me what they saw on the front end. But because I know everything, I missed it. And I experienced more problems on the back end because I didn't listen on the front end. Their expectations were misplaced because they had the wrong agenda the disciples made the mistake of thinking that the Messiah was coming to restore David's kingdom they thought that God was coming through Jesus to remove the government or the Roman government and place Jesus at the head of this new government and I want to tell you that when times are dark in your life when loved ones die when tragedy happens in your life and when your heart doesn't sense Christ, you start to think that maybe he's not God. Can I plant myself right here? When my mother passed, I struggled for a month. I knew she was sick. I had got to the point that I asked God to call her home. Because I saw what nobody saw the last seven weeks. Not even my father. He couldn't even go in the hospital. I was the only one. He didn't see my mother for two months prior to her death because of COVID. So I watched the physical deterioration. I watched it all. I couldn't grieve because I was in work mode. I, I just want to help somebody today. I couldn't grieve because I was working. And I got angry with God. And I said, God, how dare you do this to me? I've been faithful. I support the church. I'm not perfect. I give to the church. I plant in the church. God, I'm traveling. I'm doing all of this stuff. But why would you let mama die? My expectations were misplaced. Because at some point, the body will give out. At some point, God will call us home. And I was angry with God for about 10 minutes, but I was angry with God because my expectations were misplaced. How often do we get angry with God because our plans don't work out like we thought they should? It's your misplaced expectations. And you got to be careful about asking God and expecting God to do certain things that God never told you to do. He never told you to get into. He never told you to start that business. He never told you to take that job. Misplaced expectations. Because when God ordains a thing, come hell to high water, whatever he ordains will come to pass. Despite your doubts, 
Despite when you lack faith, it will come to pass. Even when you mess up, God has a way of taking the things that you messed up because you are in his will and it's ordained. He'll take that mess up and mature you in your faith and show you, I had this all for you. I just wanted you to be patient. My timing. God's timing. Misplaced expectations. Here's the third thing that we can learn from the text. You have to learn how to invite him in. Verse 29, invite him in. But they urged him strongly, stay with us. For it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So they went in and stayed with them. Did you see it? The day was ending. They invited Jesus in to their home. Listen, I believe I'm standing on truth. So if I say something that offends you, bless the Lord. The problem in most of our homes, we don't invite Jesus in. The problem in most of our relationships, we don't invite Jesus in. But then when we invite him in, we don't give him full reign to evaluate every area, every crack of the home, the marriage, the finances, or the relationship. It's one thing to invite him in, but it's another thing to invite him in and then you are submissive when he comes in. The problem is we keep inviting him, but we won't submit. We won't submit because we want it our way. We won't submit because we've been waiting on this and I've just been waiting on Jesus and he's not moving fast enough. So since you won't move, I'll move and I'll make it happen. You got to invite him in. The disciples, that's Cleophas and the unnamed one, invited him in. But when they invited them, him in, look what happened. They started listening to the voice of truth. How do I know? Before they invited him in, Jesus cracked open the Old Testament. Jesus started talking about himself and reviewing the Old Testament prophets from Moses to Malachi. Jesus was letting them know that the Old Testament was all about him. When we come to church, the Bible is all about Jesus. In today's church world, we make it all about us. It's about you, but it's not about you. The preeminence is not on you. The preeminence is on Jesus. So now we come to church with a narcissistic attitude because we think it's about me. Give me more. I deserve this. Give me, give me, give me. When was the last time that you gave? You gave worship, you gave prayer, you gave finances, and you gave your praise. He gave them the voice of truth. He spoke about himself and he referred back to the Old Testament. Here's the problem that we're facing today. Instead of listening to the voice of truth and the word of truth, we listen to the voices of deception. We're listening to the voice of the enemy. I'm going here today. I know it's Easter. We're listening to the voice of Lil Nas. Yes. We're listening to the voices of those in Hollywood. I'm going here today. Pray for pastor. We listen to the voices of Cardi B. Yes. Megan Stallion. And because we listen to their voices so much, their voices and their videos and their music drowned out the voice of the word and the voice of the Holy Spirit because we are more faithful to them than we are to God. We got to get back to listening to the voice of truth. The word of God is God's truth. And the truth is found in the word that's given by the Father through the Holy Spirit. So I want to say to our youth, be careful about listening to deception. Some of our youth are struggling with low self-esteem. 
because you listen to the wrong voices. When you are God's property and you realize that you are made and crafted by God and you are his poem, P-O-E-M, you are his masterpiece. How dare you walk around with low self-esteem and thinking you are not more than enough. You are more than enough. You are more than a conqueror. Whatever you set your mind to, you can't do because God has given you life. He's breathed life in you and you have the Holy Spirit in you. Children, stop listening to the voices of the world. The voices of social media. Start listening to the voice of truth. Here's the reason why. All this stuff will fade. But the voice of truth will remain forever. Can I say a few more things on this one? I'm reading a book right now on biblical prophecies. It's not prophesying saying you're going to get this, you're going to get this. It is prophecies that Jesus spoke that are recorded in the Bible that we can look back to and we can see all of it coming to pass. And one of the prophecies is in Matthew chapter 14, uh, 24, where it talks about sexual immorality, it will get worse. Violence, it will get worse. You know what we're seeing today? Prophecy come to pass. And parents, it behooves you to make sure you are teaching the Bible in your home, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Stop waiting on Minister Sweeney, and you put in work, you crack open the word, and you train your children in biblical principles that when the devil comes at them, they will stand on biblical principles. Can I get an amen? It's your job as the parent to train your children biblically. But what we do is wait for Sundays for youth church. And they get 30 minutes. But they are experiencing the devil seven days a week. These men invited Jesus in. They heard about the Old Testament prediction about him. They experienced intimacy and it changed them. When you invite a man, when you submit, it changes you. And here's the first fourth thing that we learn, and I'm done. You learn how to share the word. That when you link up with the voice of truth, you understand how valuable the gospel is. We share the gospel with words, but we live the gospel out in our life. Quit telling your children, don't do what I do, do what I say. More is caught than taught. They're watching you. They're listening, but they're watching. Look at the children shaking their hand. Amen, pastor, keep preaching. They are watching you. Our children watch us. The gospel is lived out in words, but in lifestyle. Look at verse 32 as we close. Verse 32. The two men, they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us? Why he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. Then they got up, they returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, Is it true? The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. And the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke bread. When they had a clear understanding of the word, they invited him in. And once they invited them, him in, they experienced fellowship, intimacy. And because of fellowship and intimacy, they shared the word. Could it be we don't share the word 
because we have no fellowship and no intimacy? Could it be that we don't share the word, the gospel, because we're not getting in the word? Could it be we don't share the word because we don't value the word enough to share with people what God has done in our lives and what he's done for me, he can do for you. We got to share the word. Slow down. Pull back. Invite him in. Experience fellowship. Intimacy. Fellowship, intimacy produces a heart to want a disciple. I'm going off script because I want to be open to the Holy Spirit. You know what's missing in the church? Discipleship. We don't want to do the hard things together. We don't want to be accountable to one another. We don't want wise counseling. We think we have it figured out. But I don't care how old you are, there's still more to learn. It's through discipleship. And when these men shared the gospel, the gospel exploded throughout the world. I want to end with a challenge this morning. When was the last time you shared the gospel? When was the last time you shared Jesus with someone else? He got up for you today. I can't prove it by a calendar, but this is the day we celebrate the risen Savior. He got up. But he got up in your life. And if you look back over your life and all that God has brought you through, why wouldn't you want to tell the story to someone who doesn't know Jesus? So I want to be open to the Holy Spirit. I'm totally off script. Today I want to pray that on Resurrection Sunday, there is a burning in our heart to share the gospel, a burning desire as the old church would say, we are beggars getting bread, but sharing that bread with other beggars. All of us know people in our family that don't know Jesus, in our workplace that don't know Jesus. Share the gospel. And when you share the gospel, watch how Jesus takes that seed and that seed takes root and it blossoms in their heart and they will be just like these two men. God will blow their mind. Do I have any people in this building today that you want God to literally blow your mind, not what he does in your life, but in the life of your children, in the life of your home, in the life of your family? I don't know about you, but I want God to blow my mind. God loves you. And he desires a relationship with you. But sin separates you. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. That sin keeps you from experiencing the fulfilling life that God intends for you. That you are eternally separated from God. But I have good news. Jesus rescues you. Jesus offers you peace with God and relationship with him. Through faith in Jesus, you can experience God's love daily. So our question today is, will you trust Jesus by placing your faith in him as your savior? Would you pray with me? God, thank you for sending your son to die for my sins. I ask that you will forgive me of my sins. Today, I confess Jesus as my savior. I place my faith in him. Lord, I surrender my life to you. I ask that you, Lord, would be the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you made that decision to trust Christ as Savior, please email us at info at globaloutreachcc.org.